Okay. Matthew 24, starting in verse 1. Yeshua went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Yeshua said unto them, See you not all these things? Truly I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall be not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Yeshua answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceives you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Messiah, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Why did Yeshua give his disciples a prophecy about the end times? And what can we learn from it? In Matthew 24, Yeshua speaks of future events. Yeshua prophecies quite clearly the fall of the temple in Jerusalem in Matthew 24, verse 2, that actually happened around 70 AD. And with it came the end of the Jewish era. But he also prophesied the end of the world, too. And we will be wise to learn from history. You know, someone once said, history is going somewhere. It's not meaningless, it's not a random, and it's not eternal. There will be a real end, just as there was a real beginning. And at the end of it, we will find Yeshua Messiah. History is the real sense Yeshua story. He made the world, Yeshua made the world. You can find this in the first chapter of John. He came to dwell in it. He will return to the, to, at the end of history to wind it up. In John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from Yahweh whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but it was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of Yahweh, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of Elohim. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We can learn from history. We, we live in the present. But why did Yeshua bother to tell us about the future? First, to warn us so we are not led astray by false prophets. 
There's always been a natural tendency for people to be attracted by prophetic utterances of the future. In the late 19th century, in America, there was an enthusiasm for such prophecies predicting the actual date of Messiah's second coming. One such prophet was the Adventist leader, William Miller. And it is in his movement that we get both the Jehovah Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists. They find their roots. Miller first predicted the Messiah will return on the 21st of March, 1842, but then revised the date to April 3rd, 1843. You might have thought that the movement would have died, but it didn't. Rather, it continued to grow. Miller decided to recalculate his date for the second coming and soon publicized a new date of April 18th, 1844. And when the Messiah did not show up on that date, there was again frustration and some followers left the Adventist ranch. Undeterred by these failures, Miller came up with a third date, the 22nd of October, 1844. As doomsday approached, the Millerites began to prepare. One account notes that the fields were left unharvested, shops were closed, people quit their jobs, paid their debts, and freely gave away their possessions with no thought of repayment. William Miller himself began peddling white ascension robes to the faithful, many of whom waited for this miraculous event in freshly dug graves. That's weird. But as we all know, Hey, the second coming didn't come. Back in the 22nd of October, 1844. Yeshua is eager to spare his followers the pain of the letdown that false prophets bring, and the real sense of loss that accompanies it. Now, the second reason Yeshua gave this prophecy was to remind his congregation that he wants us to keep his mission in the forefront of our hearts and minds. For Yeshua summed up the end times like this, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, the whole world, as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The primary goal of the congregation is to preach the message of the kingdom of Yahweh, not to be sidetracked by idle speculations. We need to keep our eye on the ball. The third reason I believe Yeshua gave this prophecy was so that we could be ready for the events when they come. It's a bit like hazard lights on the highway. They warn you of a hazard up ahead before you even get, get there. Many of Yeshua's hearers were going to live through a catechismic event, the destruction of the temple in, in Jerusalem. It turned out to be a terrible siege that lasted almost four years. The city was defended with fanaticism. The Romans tried to starve the Jews out, and in the end, the inhabitants resorted to cannibalism. A million Jews were killed, and almost 100,000 were taken into captivity. The third century historian Eusebius records an interesting story. Some Jewish <coughs> believers living in Jerusalem got out just before the siege and fled to Pella in Transjordan. Why? The reason Eusebius gives is that they left in response to an oracle given by Revelation. Were they simply heeding Yeshua's words? Yeshua gave us prophecy so that we will not be led astray by false prophets. And as we see catechismic events around us, it is easy to take our eye off the ball. We are called to preach the gospel of the kingdom and not to be caught up in fairy tales. Martin Luther once said that if I knew Christ was coming tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree. And finally, we need to be ready for the future. There will be an end to this world, not by our own doings, but when Yahweh's time is right. We don't need to worry. It is in Yahweh's hands. But the question is, will we be ready for it? 
Matthew 24, 36 says, But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the, the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your master does come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. So how should we live in the end times? Remember, therefore keep watch, because you do not know what day your master will come. Matthew 24, verse 42. Now, like I was saying, in the 19th century America, there was a wave of enthusiasm and for prophecies predicting the actual date for the Messiah's second coming. At the start I told you about the Advent leader William Miller and it is his movement that both the Jehovah Witness and Seventh-day Adventists find their roots. Miller first re predicted Christ would return on the 21st of March 1842 but then revised it to the April 3rd 1843 now over 3,500 of his followers jammed the Boston Advent Temple only to be disappointed. You might have thought that movement would have died, but it didn't. Rather, it continued to grow. Miller decided to recalculate his date for the second coming. Soon published a new date, April 18, 1844. When the Messiah didn't, did not show up on that date, there was again frustration and some followers left. Undeterred by these failures, Millers came up with a third date, the 22nd of October, 1844. The date was published in the Millerite publication, True Midnight Cry. And this third date surprisingly rallied his followers again. They began to spread the news of the new date and the second coming with the enthusiasm that had not been seen before. Churches which did not accept this message were denounced as agents of Babylon and the devil. And despite opposition from established mainline religious groups, thousands of people, including many clergy, began to defect to the Millerite cult. As doomsday approached, the Millerites began to prepare. In one account notes, like I said, the fields were left unharvested, shops were closed, people quit their jobs, paid their debts, and freely gave away their possessions with no thought of repayment. Huge press runs of Advent publications like the Midnight Cry warned the public that that time is short, prepare to meet thy God, and the Lord is coming. William Miller himself began peddling white ascension robes to the faithful, many of whom waited in the miraculous event in freshly dug graves. But as we know, the second coming did not occur on the 22nd of October, 1844. In fact, they had, if they had read the words of Yeshua from the Bible and believed them, they would ha not have been taken in by the Miller's false prophecy. Having the advantage of time, I'm amazed how Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth ever made the bestseller list in the late 70s. His predictions based on biblical prophecy can now be seen to be so off beam. But predictions about the end times like horoscopes are exceedingly popular. It is interesting that Yeshua refused to be drawn into speculation about the end times. So what are we to do about the end times? We are simply to be ready. 
for Yeshua speaking about the second coming said this in Matthew 24 verse 36 but of that day and hour knows no man no not even the angels of heaven but my father only and in Matthew 24 verse 42 watch watch therefore for you know not what hour your master does come it is the time we look forward to Messiah's second coming but as I reflect on the meaning of his coming, I find myself drawn to three ideas in the gospel passage, ideas I think that are useful to think about. He is, he is really coming. And remember, Yeshua's coming to this earth 2,000 years ago, lived a sinless life, and was put to death, rose three days and three nights later. And the first of these ideas is that we can look forward to his second coming in glory. One day. That is something special to look forward to. I don't know about you, but I think it is. Yeshua, speaking about his second coming, in a parallel passage in Mark's gospel said in Mark 13, 26, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost parts of the earth to the uttermost parts of heaven. Our great hope is that he will come again. He will usher in a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more tears, no more suffering, and Yeshua himself will be the light in our midst. In Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Yahweh out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Yahweh himself shall be with them, and be their Elohim. And Yahweh shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things I passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his Elohim and he shall be my son. Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of Yahweh and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Yahweh and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no light night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for Yahweh Elohim gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Perhaps we should live our lives all year round preparing for that event. Yahweh has work for us to do on earth. This is the second idea that struck me from the passage is that Yahweh still has work for us to do here. We are called to live our life in our communities, loving our neighbors as ourselves and sharing the good news of Yahweh's kingdom and his Messiah with our neighbors. In our gospel reading today, Yeshua had this to say about the time in which we are living, leading up to the second coming. In Matthew 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your master does come, but know this, that 
if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken. Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. The thief is the devil, and he will come and try to steal your time. He will try to steal your loyalty. He will try to steal your faith. He will try to steal your peace. He will try to steal your happiness. He will try to steal your health. He will try to steal your freedom and Messiah. He will try to steal your marriage. You name it, the devil is out to get it. The only way to foil the devil is to be on our guard and study the Bible. We are a deeply spiritual, inquisitive nation. How else can we account for the avid addiction to horoscopes in the national press or on television? I find that a lot of people would pore over the Bible, fascinated by the prophecies of Revelation, but few of them would go further and commit them set their lives to Messiah. Yeshua wants us to focus on living the believer's life today, not dreaming of the future. He wanted us to be secure in the knowledge that he will come again, but he does not want us to be stargazing. At Yeshua's ascension in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, the 11 disciples were left staring into the sky. Two angels sent to remind them that Yahweh still had a mission for them. Acts 1 verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Yeshua, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall, go, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Yahweh has a mission for us, to preach the gospel, the good news of the kingdom to those around us in the way we live and what we say. Let's not be found wanton in the, when he's returned. Watch, be alert. The final thought that I would like to leave you with from our reading is that Yeshua wants us to be alert. He wants us to be so well schooled in scripture that we cannot be taken in by false prophets as the Millerites were 150 years ago. Challenge everything you hear from the pulpit. Ask yourself the question, does what is being preached coincide with what's written in the Bible? The good news the gospel passage is a challenge to carefully mull over what we hear from our pulpits. What are the preachers saying? Does it match up with what's in the Bible? It's your job to figure that out. Otherwise you will be deceived. In conclusion, our gospel reading encourages us to know that one day Yeshua will return in glory. It encourages us to know that Yeshua wants us to go on living as if he was coming tomorrow. As they say in the military, to be on red alert. If he came tomorrow, would you be embarrassed by what he would find you doing? And <coughs> Yeshua wants us to be on our guard against being led astray by false prophets and false teachers. Study his word. Be able to say, that don't sound right. Where is that found in the Bible? And then look it up. May Yahweh bless you with wisdom and eyes to see his truth. Yahweh bless.